My name is Mark Elgar and I'm a professor in the School of Biosciences and my research is in animal behaviour and evolution um, and I'm interested in a range of topics. Mostly uh, I'm fascinated by the way in which um, various characteristics of animals have evolved and my interests are in trying to understand what factors are responsible for that evolution. So animals uh, don't live in isolation um, and will signal to animal, other animals um, in almost all species of animals. Um, the exceptions would be those, for example, that are um, asexual and don't require to get together with uh, members of the opposite sex. So beyond that, uh, at the very least, one animal, uh, uh, typically a female, will need to uh, convey her presence to another male. And she does that by uh, signaling. And she could produce an odor uh, that uh, the males might detect, or she could be um, uh, create uh, sounds uh, that, uh, that might uh, draw attention to her. <clears throat> but by far the more spectacular uh, forms of, of signaling in that context is more typically with males that are trying to convince the female uh, that they're the right male for her to mate with. And uh, their selection has favoured a range of um, adaptations, male adaptations. Fabulous song, uh, fabulous um, body colours, uh, dances and so on. And they're all geared towards one thing, which is trying to convince the female that he's the right person to mate with. And then there are other signals in other contexts where animals may in fact be signaling to other animals that this is an area that they um, own, if you like, and they are attempting to tell other animals to clear off. So a kookaburra is a very good example of that. Uh, it sounds like a, a very funny call, but they're not at all amused when they're calling it. They're very emphatically telling other kookaburras to clear off. Um, and then amongst social species, there's a whole range of other signals that animals might use uh, to convey uh, important information. Um, in all of these instances, uh, there's a very precise link between a signal and the information that that signal is conveying. So a kookaburra's laugh is conveying a very significant message, clear off. Um, a brightly colored um, peacock spider is conveying a very specific message to a female, I'm the one. Um, and even in social uh, uh, insects, for example, which have very, very complex, far more complex societies than humans have, um, there they rely on very specific signals that provide information to other individuals within the colony of what they're doing, uh, which colony they belong to, and a whole suite of other things. Bees, for example, provide a very specific signal about the location of food in a complex dance. All of these things have a direct link. In, um, in mammals, and in particular in primates, uh, they still use this quite simple process of conveying information in a linked specifically to a signal. In mammals, it's often also linked to an emotion. So uh, when an animal is fearful, um, or most mammals are fearful, uh, if they're social, they, that fear will trigger a particular signal, like an alarm call. Or in the case of uh, chimpanzees, if they discover a, a cache of food, they'll make a food call. They're not able to uh, prevent that signal from going forward. That really differs from human language and our means of communication, because your viewers right now have absolutely no idea what my emotion is. They don't know if I'm hungry, if I'm sad, I'm happy, or any of those things, because I'm communicating quite independently of those emotions. Now, that's not to say that I can communicate emotionally, uh, and uh, nothing uh, is perhaps more raw than seeing someone who is uh, in a state of intense grief and is trying to communicate.
and often they can't. <clears throat> but that's the difference in the first instance. So we can communicate uh, voluntarily, whereas in the most part animals communicate, particularly mammals, involuntarily. So it's really tied to some kind of emotion. The second thing is that our communication can convey a whole lot of information that is quite, um, uh, generates in fact some quite complex notions. And we can communicate things that happened in the past, we can communicate about things that are happening right now, and we can communicate things that might happen in the future, or, and I think this is most important, things that we haven't imagined. And of course it's that latter part is what really builds up, I think, our capacity for culture. We can imagine a bridge spanning uh, a river, or at least that's what our ancestors did. And in that imagining, they would have had to have communicated that to other individuals to convince them that they need to chop down trees and build that bridge. So that's the power of our communication. Now, as a scientist, it's a little bit difficult, of course, to prove that animals don't have those capacities. And I suppose the answer to that is, well, they don't have it in the same way that we do because we don't see universities in the water with dolphins attending, or we don't see uh, artwork made by elephants. Um, these are all things that we see in humans and not uh, in other animals. It's not to say that I'm um, belittling other animals, I'm just saying that this, no matter how much you might want uh, other animals to have all of the attributes that we have, it simply isn't manifested in the way that they um, behave. So, so that capacity of imagination sits around language, and it's language uh, that I think allows us to be so completely different from other, uh, other animals. Now, the way that the language is, is structured is um, uh, quite technical um, and um, and I'm certainly not an expert in that area. But how we acquired that language, what processes were involved in the evolution of human language, I think is really fascinating. And there are kind of two schools of thought that sit around this. Uh, Darwin imagined that we evolved verbal language from the grunts and, uh, and snorts and other sounds that our ancestors made. Um, but that's quite an unlikely process because our capacity to speak almost certainly evolved after we had a capacity for language. And, um, and the other side of, of this view, which is championed by uh, an amazing uh, character, Michael Corballus from New Zealand, uh, Auckland in New Zealand, uh, he argues very strongly that language has evolved uh, not directly from grunts, but by gestures. And you'll notice that every now and again, I'm sort of waving my hands. Um, and it's these gestures uh, that may be the forefront of language. So we actually initially communicated with gestures and then subsequently used uh, vocal language to replace gestures. And if anyone is in any doubt as to the power of uh, um, language through gestures, uh, there's universities in the US where they're for people that are uh, unable to hear or, or speak, uh, and everything is done in signing language that you would have happening in a university which uh, uses vocal communication. So it's certainly not a language that is deficient in any way uh, in terms of expressing ideas or concepts. I mean, we, we anthropomorphize and project, uh, and that's what we can do as humans, of course, is project emotions or um, imagine uh, that uh, animals have these quintessentially human attributes as well. And, you know, and I'm uh, um, at the risk of... Uh, of um, <laughs> being vilified by every dog owner uh, globally, uh, the reality is that your dog um, probably has some 
capacity to read what your emotion is, but whether that's the same as being able to empathize, I would argue probably not. So uh, I have a, a border collie and I'd have to say that she's actually trained me to do a number of tricks, even though I thought I was actually training her to do it. The reality, of course, is that neither of us are really training it. We were both learning uh, associations between particular things, and this was actually for her learning that uh, if she didn't go to the door immediately when I called her to do so, uh, but waited a while, she would get a reward in the form of a treat. The reality from my side was I was getting so exasperated to try and get this dog out of the house that I pulled out a treat as an inducement. So in fact, our perspectives of these two things are quite different. Uh, and I think that we do this all the time when we interact with humans. Mm. The key thing is, though, that language requires a degree of empathy. And, um, or it's, technically, it's, it's more than empathy. It's called theory of mind. But it's a bit like empathy. So for you to be able to understand what I'm saying, you actually have to understand what I'm saying. And, um, and this is quite a difficult aspect uh, of understanding the evolution of language because this theory of mind or empathy must have evolved from something that was a little less perfect. We must have the neurological mechanisms that allow us to do this. So in the case of animal signaling, um, a female can pump out as much um, sex pheromone as she wants to but if the males don't have particular receptors on their antennae that can detect those odors, then her signal uh, is, has no effect at all. So in the same way that if, you're, if, if our neurobiological systems are unable to register what we're hearing and then empathize what that means, then the language, uh, whether it's vocal or gestural, has no meaning. And it turns out that, um, that, that there is mechanism for that within uh, our, um, our uh, ancestors, or at least in, uh, amongst primates. And so uh, people have looked at the response of, of monkeys when you give them a nut, and you can do recordings in their brain, and it all fires up. And then if you allow a monkey to see someone give another monkey a nut, the same kind of uh, area of the brain starts lighting up again, indicating that whilst the monkey is not receiving that reward, it empathizes in some neurological way what that other monkey is getting. So it's like when we tell people a story, uh, uh, something really good that's happened, it makes us feel good we empathize with, with that particular story. So the underlying mechanisms are there. And so in some ways, to say, well, um, as I said earlier, is the dog really empathizing with me? Or is it learning that if I'm dragging my feet around the place, then I've just given a terrible lecture and I'm feeling bad about it? Uh, whereas if I'm very buoyant, it means that, you know, um, I'm looking forward to something that's happening on the weekend. and and it may or may not behave differently. I, I've not tested it, but I feel as if it does. So there's a side of me as a scientist that says, yeah, well, you're going into the realms of fanciful thinking here, Mark, or there's a dog owner that says, I've got this great dog that just really understands me.